All right, folks, we're almost at the top of the hour. We'll get started in just a minute. If you want to drop a note in the chat about where you're zooming in from or um, tell us in YouTube if you're watching there. Uh, looks like we have Tennessee, Boulder, Colorado, British Columbia, home state of New York, um, Chicago, all over. This is fantastic. Folks are still piling in. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, where we'll answer all of your birding, bird migration questions, or at least as many as we can get to within our short hour we have here. My name is Sarah Wagner, and I'm the Public Information Specialist here at the Visitor Center at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and I'll be facilitating today's conversation. With us today is Kevin McGowan, who will be joining us in just a minute. But before we get started, I have a few quick announcements I want to make. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, we are home to a community of researchers and supporters from around the world who appreciate birds and the integral roles they play in our ecosystems. Our mission is to advance leading edge research, education, and citizen science that helps to solve pressing conservation challenges. Today's webinar is the conclusion of our two-week migration celebration, which is the lab's largest online event every year. Um, you can check out our migration resources and tools to help you better enjoy um, and do your own recording of what you're seeing with migration um, on our website. So we'll drop that link in the chat um, so you can see past uh, webinars from other migration celebrations and, and the few that we've done for this year's migration celebration. So check those out. Um, I have a couple of quick technical notes for the audience, um, and then we can get started. Closed captioning is available on Zoom. If you'd like to turn captions on or off, please click the captions button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you on Zoom, click the Q&A button and then type your question there. We'll be answering some questions verbally, and for others, we'll be typing in responses, which you'll be able to see in the answered column. So that's a great resource to check out. You'll get some really good information there. Please only use the Zoom chat for technical support or to share information. I have lots of colleagues on the, the back end who are um, going to help respond to Zoom Q&As uh, in the chat. Um, so if you have technical issues, if you're having trouble with um, with anything related to Zoom, put, pop those um, questions into the chat. Uh, we're also live streaming to YouTube. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can add your questions to the comments and another colleague will relay from there. So for those of you who have attended our webinars before, um, today is a little bit different. We wanted to give you an opportunity to ask your burning questions about migration, um, especially as we enter that season this, this fall. Um, at least in our part of the world. Luckily, we have Kevin McGowan with us today. Kevin, you can go ahead and turn on your camera. Hey, Kevin. Kevin not only knows the research and science very deeply, he also has a real knack for explaining it, and he's a fantastic storyteller. To start, Kevin, thank you for being with us today, and could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Uh, I'm Kevin McGowan. I'm in Bird Academy here at the lab. I write bird courses and instruct uh, people about birds, biology and identification, things like that. Basically, I'm an ornithologist. I've been studying birds for a very long time. Uh, I got my PhD working on Florida scrub jays. I've been studying American crows for the last 35 years. Uh, and I'm also an avid birder and a total bird head. I mean, I there are a few of us around the lab like that. You might imagine that uh, anything bird I'm interested in, and so that means that I do pay attention to think. Basically, I'm a behavioral ecologist, but I, I like knowing all kinds of things, physiology and genetics, and and anything bird is good for me. So that's uh, that's why I'm happy to answer all these questions that people are are wanting to know about birds. 
Awesome. I'm excited. Okay, let's get started with some of our questions that came in um, from folks who pre-registered. So we'll start with this question from Paula, which should set the stage for us. Why do bird mi birds migrate and what are they searching for? People should know that not all birds migrate. Some birds just stay in the same place all year long. Um, and that's because they can, uh, but other birds are... Um, other birds are being uh, feeding on food that, that that is no longer available. So if we think about the birds up in the boreal forest, the chickadees stay there all year round. They can find, believe it or not, insect eggs and little things like that in the bark that they can find enough food to keep them keep them going during the winter. But a lot of the other birds are, feed on flying insects or moving insects, and there aren't too many of those up up in Canada in the, the winter time. So they have to go somewhere else to find food. Migration is almost always about finding food. Uh, it's not to get out of the cold because birds can survive cold, uh, but there are certain inhospitable places that they need to leave, uh, but it's almost always about food. All right, great. Food, the great inspiration. Um, okay, Janet asks, what prompts the start of bird migration? And how do we think the birds can sense these seasonal weather changes? Additionally, why do some birds migrate earlier than others? Well, the, the thing that starts bird migration usually is a, a change in uh, daylight le day length, the length of daylight. Uh, and what that does is that starts, this is sort of the, the proximate mechanism that that uh, gets the birds uh, brains changing more different hormones being produced and the birds can can sense the uh, even very small changes in daylight length uh, and we find even in the tropics or the near tropics like in Panama that some of the the uh, ant birds down there can notice the change in daylight length uh, even though it's almost 12, year, 12 hours a day, uh, but there's a small enough change that it actually influences their, their behavior and their physiology. Why do some birds migrate earlier than others? Uh, par partially because their food supply runs out or they just need to get the heck out of there. The things that we find migrating first through uh, here in central New York are actually the, the shorebirds. And the shorebirds breed up in the very high Arctic uh, and there's not a not a long season there. So if they've succeeded in raising young or failed in in raising young, they get the heck out of there early uh, and and move through. And then we start to see basically the more northern birds migrate first because they it's getting cold up there already. So uh, their food supplies are starting to decline. And so different birds migrate at different times because they're following different resources. Uh, and some of them have farther to go than others to go to to uh, their final wintering grounds. So it's not necessarily that like all the raptors would go next. It would kind of depend on where they're coming from. Certainly that's true. Uh, I mean, there are a few things, as I say, we, we see the shorebirds move early. We see the waterfowl move late. Um, and so you can make some broad generalizations for some birds. Uh, but uh, uh, in general, it's it depends on their their own personal um, biology, what they what they need to keep going. So yes, we can find some even within a group. There will be early ones and later ones. So um, like like we can tell here in the in in upstate New York, we can pretty well distinguish the dowagers, the two species of dowagers that come through because short billed dowager migrate through very very early. And then late in the migration season for shorebirds, we see mostly long-billed dowagers. And so that's actually a key clue to their identification uh, is when you're actually seeing them come migrating through. Super helpful. <laughs> um, let's see. So this is sort of similar, but Tracy asks, does the time of migration change every year? Is there a lot of fluctuation in the the timing? And what are the, you already talked about birds that stick around, but um, with chickadees, if you have other examples of birds that stick around. Sure. Um, 
I'm trying to remember what the first part of that was. Does the time of migration change every year? No, yeah. in fact, it's actually fairly rigorous in some species. Uh, the, it's very, very predictable. Like when uh, when red winged blackbirds turn up in central New York is is always within a two week period. Um, and so some of these things are very precise. However, migration on a you know for an individual bird depends on the uh, circumstances that that bird is in, and that includes changes in weather and and local conditions and stuff like that. So there's always that sort of fine tuning. So it's never precisely the same. You know, it's like the swallows coming back to to Capistrano, um, or the buzzards coming back to Hinckley, Ohio. The turkey vultures. Um, they they pretend it's a, a single day, but it's usually a little slop around it. But but it, again, it's it is very predictable to a certain degree if you if you give them the allowance of of uh, you know Man, it's raining today. I'll do it tomorrow, kind of thing. Right, it isn't predictable, but it's surprisingly uh, surprisingly uh, consistent from year to year. Yeah. Um, we got a lot of folks asking um, specifically, here's one from Cora, why do some species age groups appear to begin migration at different times? There are also a lot about, so if you want to answer at the same time, um, people asking why different age groups did and different sexes, like why aren't they all just going at the same time? Yeah, that's an interesting thing about migration is we tend to think, oh, well, yeah, they just go, but they don't, um, that there are different, different, the sexes do different things. Uh, and the the juveniles do different things. And typically what, what you see going first are the, the, the males, the breeding males of a, a lot of different birds leave the, ground, the breeding grounds before uh, the females and the juveniles do. And then as a, as, again, as a general rule of thumb, the, the adults leave first and then the juveniles leave later. And maybe they just need a, a longer time to fatten up to, to, uh, to migrate, but uh, that's very, a very predictable pattern that we see like in uh, it's easy to see in, in ruby-throated hummingbirds in the eastern U.S. and Canada that the males disappear a couple of weeks before the females uh well the females are around so you, you stop seeing male hummingbirds here and sometime in August uh but the females still hang around into into September although they're pretty well headed to Texas by now so. yeah and does that behavior look a lot different like if you're watching your hummingbird feeder and it's just females there I mean I, I feel like we see a lot of seasonal shifts in reports from hummingbird feeders oh absolutely absolutely um yeah changes in behavior and changes in uh, uh the, the sex ratios and things like that also I will say on some other species in some species of birds the males and females actually winter in different areas and so like the females will will go farther south than the males of, of some species like white-throated sparrows and, and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of that is tied to the fact that the males are actually coming back before the females. So like red-winged blackbirds come back to their breeding grounds in the north. Um, the males come uh, uh, several weeks before the females do. And partly that's their biology where they're they're trying to set up territories because the females are going to come and pick a male based on his territory. And so they need to, the, the good males want to get there early and, uh, you know, make sure they, they get the best spots. The problem with that in places like Canada or upstate New York is that we get we get winter storms and squalls and things early in the spring and so you can't go too early or you die in some right. so the, that's that's the thing it's in some years it's a great strategy to be the first one there because you get the best territory you get uh, a couple of females and you produce the most young but the next year doing exactly the same thing you may get, there may be a big storm and you die so there's a lot of selection for uh taking risks but not being too risky right um, I think we'll get into navigation in just a minute, but um, what about species that there's a component of their migration where they actually need to go with parents in order to, to know the route? Is that something that happens? It is. Actually, surprisingly few birds do this that, that follow their family, but waterfowl and cranes are ones that we know that do that uh, most birds seem to uh, figure out their migratory route um based on just instinct you know 
wanting to go in a certain direction for a certain amount of time. Uh, but some birds actually learn their, their roots. And in things like uh, geese, the young geese follow their parents. So you'll see a big flock of geese. And if you look in it, you'll see uh, juvenile geese and they'll be little family groups, and like in snow geese. Snow geese are easy to, to tell the juveniles apart from the adults. Canada geese, not so much. But if you look at a, a, a flock of snow geese, you'll often see two, two adult birds that have a couple of, of youngsters hanging with them. And then when they take off, the, the whole family leaves as a, as a group. And so they lead their kids down to where they, where they want to winter. Same thing with cranes. And we've been actually, people have used um, uh, ultralights, to ultralight planes to uh, lead captive raised uh, cranes to a, a, a wintering ground. It's, this has been done in, in Europe too with uh, uh, some ibis and I forget what else I was reading about somebody in Germany who was who would recently who was uh, really good at uh, leading the uh, some of these big birds around um, teaching them where to to go to migrate. Most birds don't do that though. Most birds um, find their way and somehow it's it's really quite remarkable. We don't know how a lot of birds find their way to the their wintering grounds or how they determine it. Certainly a lot of them learn uh, what to do, but uh, other ones end up getting there, you know, on their own. The, and actually the, this is something that I, I have to, I have to tell this one because this is one of the um, most amazing stories I ever, I ever heard of. And this was like, we're, I will say we're, getting better and better devices, smaller and more complicated devices to actually track birds on migration. And the results are thrilling. To be able to see exactly where uh, some of these individual birds go is just really, really mind boggling uh, with some really fun, fun results coming out. But some of the results are stuff that just make you scratch your head and say, what? They did what? How did they do that? And the very first talk I ever saw at an American Ornithologist Society meeting was uh, of a guy who was uh, satellite putting satellite transmitters on uh, swallowtailed kites in Florida. And swallowtailed kites uh, breed from Florida down into South America, but they're resident populations in South America. So when our birds go down there, we don't know who they are because they just blend in with a bunch of, of residents. And so we really didn't know where the birds breeding in, in the United States spend the winter. And so they put some satellite transmitters on, on a few of these birds. And they found that, uh, like we were talking about, the adults left before the, the juveniles did. And that the juveniles kind of flocked up, get up in big flocks, but they, they also start moving to the Southwest and, and end up uh, on the, the west coast of of the of uh, South America. And so there was one, there was a, a mother of a breeding female at a nest and her daughter that were both tagged. And the, the mother left like a month before the daughter did. Um, and they took various routes to get down there, but they all started congregating in, in uh, uh, somewhere in around Colombia and the uh it turned out that that they all went through a, a single pass in Bolivia into the Amazon basin uh and all of the birds the the mother had gotten a, a month head start but the daughter caught up to her and they went through the pass together on the same day wow and it's like what? <laughs> How could they do that? Why would they do that? That's just, uh, you know, we don't even have the right questions to ask yet about that is how you get something like that to happen. But that's what uh, birds do. And we're finding out more and more about that stuff. And that one has just stuck with me for years because that just blew me away. It just blew me yeah. away. How did they that's do incredible. that? We right. Don't know. That needs to be a book at least. Yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, let's dig into navigation a little bit more. This is a big one. Um, and in thinking about navigation techniques, the four and five-year-old classroom from the Flora and Fauna Preschool wrote in to ask, how do they know where to go and what if they forget their way? 
That's great. Well, some of them, as we just said, a few of them, a very few of them are taught where to go that their parents teach them. And uh, how? what if they forget their way? Then they get lost. And we find this turning up, not, not a lot of birds get lost, but we do know that some birds do get lost. They end up being places that none of their their same species is and, and that happens and they just kind of wander around till they find their their way back or um, they may never get to the the final destination that's that's part of it um, uh, but they may find some place that's just as good so we've had some of these uh, wayward strays some things like uh, European birds that end up in in North America and they're notable because they're rare and they sometimes go back to the same wintering place over and over again, that, that they never do get quite back on track. Uh, other ones may go home and, and figure out how to go the, take the right turn or the left turn uh, the correct way the next year, but uh, some of them don't. Um, okay. Lots of folks are wondering about time of day that different groups like to migrate and how on earth they keep up the energy to do that? Well, some different birds do migrate at different times of the day. And to a lot of people are surprised to know that the, the bulk of migration happens at night, that most birds fly at night. Uh, and there are several reasons for this. One is that they, uh, uh, you know, there are fewer predators being able to catch you at night. Um, you can't really forage that much, so you might as well fly. Um, and as we found out, um, the when their their vision gets uh, when there's not enough light to see very well, birds can actually turn on a different sense and see the magnetic fields of the Earth, and so they can tell north and south because they can see the magnetic fields. And this we. We've known that they can they can detect magnetic fields for a very long time, but we haven't been able to figure out how they did it. And only recently did we find that um, there aren't special magnet magnetoreceptors in the bill or anything like that. It's they have uh, uh, pigments in the eye that actually can get into uh, with a very low level of light. They can they can. Um, takes these the electrons on some of their atoms and get them into a quantum state that uh, is you know sort of neither here nor there and that it can uh, they're sensitive to magnetic fields and then they can see that but there there has to be some light but it can't be um, a lot of light and it's kind of like if you think about um, when you're in a dark situation and your eyes get adapted to the dark, you don't see colors. You only see sort of shades of gray. But then when the light gets strong enough, then suddenly, boom, you start to see colors. And we call that the rod cone break, where you're going from, from rods using the rod cells in your eyes that, that are really good at, at low light. But then you're switching on at higher intensities, you switch on the cones, which can see color. And so it's kind of like that, that they have a threshold that, that they go into. And that's what the first time I learned that um, this was a, the visual system that was using the magnetic fields. I thought to myself, I read that, that news and it's like, oh, that's why they fly at night is because then they can see. And that does seem to be the consensus is that uh, a lot of the, the nighttime flying uh, is because that allows them to use their magnetic sense to detect north and south. Um, I forget what the second half of that the question was. It was oh, it was about how they how they fuel themselves right, to be how they fuel that. themselves. Some birds do this differently. There are birds that migrate during the day, um, and they sometimes forage during the day. Other birds will fly for a while to a destination, then stop and spend two or three days eating to fill up along the way. Uh, and put on fat uh, to then go. So they they put on fat, fly to use up the fat, stop, put on more fat, fly to use more. Now things, other birds uh, like crows that, that do migrate to some extent, um, they will often forage during the day. 
uh, as they go because they're, they're flying by day. And an interesting uh, switch, uh, one that I just sort of really was thinking about when we put out our hummingbird course recently is a ruby-throated hummingbird, which is found breeding all over Eastern North America. And they winter uh, in Central America from West, Southwest Mexico down to, to Panama. Um, and if you think about going from Quebec to uh, uh, Guatemala City or something like that, it's uh, there's a big thing in the way. That's the Gulf of Mexico. And so they could either take the short route and fly over it or take the long route and go the easier one and go around it. And it turns out what they do is most ruby-throated hummingbirds in the fall, they take the easy route to go around it. Like all of our birds from New York are probably in Texas right now. And they they migrate through the, the coastal areas of Texas in huge numbers. There's actually a, 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 a hummingbird festival or several hummingbird festivals down there right now that uh, are, you can go one place and, and like in people in, in these towns put out uh, hummingbird feeders and you can go see 200 hummingbirds in one person's yard as the, the ruby throats go through. It's really quite a special thing. And you can... You can watch this on uh, uh, the, our status and trends maps. If somebody could throw in the, the link to the status and trend map for uh, the, the migration of the ruby-throated hummingbird, it's really cool to watch. Because what happens is, so in the fall, they're not in a hurry to get down there. They're just, you know, going to go take a vacation. So they're just lazing it down. But in the spring, they have things to do and they want to get back and they want to start breeding. And if you watch that status and trends map, what you'll see is that all of a sudden these birds start to congregate in the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. And then, boom, they're in, they're in Louisiana and Alabama, that they fly, they do fly over the Gulf in the spring completely. And that would probably take a, a hummingbird you know, maybe 15 hours of, of flying solid straight across the, the Gulf. And there's no place to sit down and take a break when you're flying across the Gulf of Mexico. So it's really quite remarkable that these birds uh, can do that. And they put on fat, they, you know, they've almost double their body weight in the Yucatan while they're, they're bulking up to make this one big, tremendous leap, but they do it. And so again, looking at that status and trends map, um, that's the first really good uh, definitive statement to me that that this is how the hummingbirds do it. You can watch them go around through Texas on the west, going going south, but then nobody goes that way. They all just jump across the Gulf. Really quite remarkable. Yeah. And the birds this big. Yeah. They're not <laughs> They're hiding. They weigh the five grams or so. It's a, you know yeah. it's like a couple of nickels and and. And it can make it all the way across the Gulf. It's quite remarkable. And it's so great to be able to watch them once they've made it because they care less about us <laughs> and more about eating. Yeah, you bet. And they, you know, I've watched, I've watched hummingbirds come off the Gulf on the west coast of Florida, and they don't go anywhere. That they just sort of drop, you know, three feet onto shore. And the one place I was watching in St. Petersburg, Florida, was uh, a patch. There was a big patch of thistles. And there were like 35 hummingbirds uh, that were that were there, you know, claiming a thistle to sit on, and 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 the, I mean, the thistles just behind the dunes, kind of thing. And it was really cool because I remember the one spring when I was down in Florida that uh, the the males turned up in, in like early April, something like that. And there was a there's just this small patch of of flowers with 30 35 male hummingbirds. One of which had a, a yellow gorget, which was really weird. All the red males, and then this guy that flashed yellow. He had some kind of problem going on with his feathers. But but then about two three weeks later, I went to the same patch, and it was full of female hummingbirds. Because again, the females are coming after it. It was several weeks after the the males had had come through. So it was really. Uh, I'm talking a lot about ruby throated hummingbirds today. But well, we had a lot of questions. So yeah, they're they're just such a spectacular story. Yeah. Yeah, there are other groups that that cross the Gulf too, right? Oh, sure. What's the difference in like how raptors use that area and some songbirds? So how would raptors do it differently? Raptors don't like to go fly over water um, because there are no updrafts, there are no thermals. A lot of a lot of raptors, 
you know, coast their way around the the world that they try to to do it with as little energy use as possible. Um, and they have learned how to take advantage of the updrafts that are created as the sunshine heats up the the land, but the sunshine does not heat up the water like that. And so there aren't these big updrafts. So in fact, most raptors tend to uh, avoid going across large bodies of water and take the, you know, the, the around the corner thing. That's why in, in Mexico, especially, and in Central America, they're like Veracruz is known for this. Thousands of raptors are concentrated coming across that spot as they go around the west of the, the the Gulf of Mexico. Same thing in in uh, in Europe and like in Israel is it in some of the places that the birds don't want to fly across the Mediterranean. They want to go around the Mediterranean, um, and so you end up with these these uh, fantastic migration uh, concentration areas where you see thousands of, of hawks coming through at one time. It's really quite spectacular. Songbirds, on the other hand, can handle it. Uh, because they're just getting up high and and cruising for as long as they can. Um, and they, again, put on, sometimes they double their body weight in fat so that they can use that fat uh, as fuel for, for long distance migrants. And some of them, like the black pole warbler, takes off from, from uh, you know, Maine and, and Nova Scotia and flies straight to, to South America. It flies over the Atlantic Ocean to, to fly straight to South America to in one, one flight, which again, a little bird this big can do that. It's just quite a remarkable story. And how, how did they figure that out? No, oh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's something says go that way for this long. And we know we can see, actually we can see this in birds, they, there gets, there's this, cool term that's in German called Zugenru. And that means migratory restlessness. Uh, and so we can you can watch this and it's been well studied in birds that if if you keep them in captivity, as the light changes, as the the, the days get get smaller or longer, they start to get antsy and they just kind of move around in their their cages and they they just want to go somewhere and Steve Emlin who used to be here at Cornell when he would, did his PhD research at University of Michigan he looked at um, these birds and actually put their, these things called Emlin funnels or he has a paper funnel with it and the birds are standing on an ink pad and they just jump in one direction and what you find is that before the the Zugenru starts they're just kind of hopping in random directions but when it starts to get to be time to go they it, they head either north or south whichever way they're supposed to be going uh and they just want to do it and they and it's just this need to uh to go further to go further go south go south go down you know and and uh it's uh, like a geist on them or whatever that that makes them just want to do that for a certain amount of time and on the the uh, proximal scale of you know how do you make it happen? It, um, that's relatively straightforward. You can imagine that I, you get a direction that you want to go, and you go for a long time, and you may find something that attracts you to stay there, or it may you may just run out of the urge to do it. And you know that's potentially the way these things work with uh, um, with birds. Yeah, Luganru, such a good word. <laughs> Um, okay, sorry. Back to questions. Um, Sylvia has one about um, staging areas. So she says, where do migrating birds gather in large flocks when they move south? For example, we see migrant warblers in the spring and fall in our yard. And I wonder when they meet up with a group. So this is coming from Ottawa. Um, yeah, some things it's obvious. I mean, waterfowl gather in the in, uh lakes and, and ponds and, and you know, along the ocean. Uh, and they like to be in, in flocks when they, when they migrate. Things like warblers, it's not so obvious. Um, and you will find loose flocks of, of things like warblers, you know, a migrating flock loosely together. Um, and I don't think that they actually necessarily go someplace to, to stage. Uh, the, 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 Songbirds make a lot of noise, 
when they're migrating. They they all seem to have a, a chip note that they give that's some of, for some birds, it's the only time they use that particular note is when they're migrating. And that's, it tends to be, we tend to think of it as being something that says, I'm here, where are you? Um, and you can hear this sometimes when uh, the thrushes are migrating in the evening, you can hear thrushes start to call right at dusk and they start to, to use this, this uh, uh, flight note that I think gets everybody in tune with where everybody is and they may start to get closer together and then um, express some level of, of excitement about what they're ready to do. And then, um, you know, they all take off and sort of keep, basically keep in touch. They aren't necessarily in a tight flock like a, like a, a bunch of geese or something like that, but uh, definitely within hearing of each other. And, and that's pretty much what they do is they make these calls all night long. And uh, I think that keeps some of the birds close to their species. Uh, okay. Just by saying, I'm, I'm here. Anybody else out there? Where are you? I lost to who asked, but someone wondered if um, some birds just go it solo, like if individuals migrate without a group. Yes, definitely some do. Um, there are some species, I'm trying to think, of, I can't think of one right offhand, but there are some birds that are, you almost never find a bunch of them together in, in on migration or in the wintering grounds. It's meant they're just not as social, right? They, right. It's like, man, they're... they're standoffish. I had a cousin like that, you know, didn't really want to socialize with the rest of us. So, right. <laughs> um, okay. Here's one. Uh, we can kind of dig into physiology with this one. Claire asks how much body weight is lost during migrate migration flights. And you touched on this a little bit, but you could go into that a little bit more if you want. Yeah. Body weight a lot. I mean, that's why one of the big things is, uh, Oh, I forget. There's a technical term for it. Like hyperphagy or something like that that means eat more than you need to um so that you put on weight and birds get into this this uh, state where they're they are in fact putting on weight on, you know almost directly from what they're eating that they're the i don't know how the metabolism changes exactly i'm not a physiologist but uh definitely when pre-migration uh, birds start eating a lot and they're putting on a lot of weight. Some birds double their weight. I mean, I I had a, I remember had skinning a, an upland sandpiper when I worked for the museum here that uh, it had, um, I forget, I think it hit, struck a window or something like that, but it had so much fat on it that when I took the fat off, it was basically half the, as much as the, the the rest of the body, and it's like wow, that's a that's a lot of fat to be carrying around. And again, some of these small birds actually double their weight, and you can see it on them. You can, if you've been to a, you know, Banders, can see some of the the fat in the furculum. That's one of the standard things that you do when you're banding a bird and assessing its condition is looking at how much fat that they have on them. But if you really wanted to see it. I mean, I've skinned a lot of birds, and when you take the skin off, there's there's a lot of fat all over the place. They just get completely covered in it, and they'll do these long flights so that that, that they're powered up to spend more than a day in flight. Uh, and then they'll get to another spot where they stop over spots on migration that can be extraordinarily important for migration for the birds to fuel up because some of these birds are going long, long distances from Canada to South America, and you can't do it in one shot. You have to you have to do your best shot and then fatten up and do it again a couple of times. And so these these places on migration, we tend to think of, oh, well, there's a breeding grounds and then there's the wintering grounds. And that's all we have to worry about. But no, they, they're these stopover spots that can be just as important uh, in in the survival of of these birds getting from one spot to another they have to stop and refuel. And that's what the thing is that you'll see in along the Gulf Coast in the spring, the birds that have come across the, the Gulf of Mexico, they're just sit in that spot for several days, foraging and foraging and, and putting on more fat before they, they move on. So it's not all, for most birds, it's not just one shot that you just keep going. Uh, usually it's 
fly and stop somewhere for a couple of days, fly to someplace else, stay there for a couple of days and keep moving along like that. Very cool. So a lot of, um, there are a few questions about what folks can do to help birds during migration. And so some of that might be like planting native plants that the birds might like to eat the fruit from, but um, Mary, Ellen, Mary Ellen asks, are there particular foods and feeders that average suburbanites can put up to help migrating birds? Well, hummingbird feeders, the hummingbirds really like hummingbird feeders and you won't make them stop migrating uh, and stick with it and stick with it your feeder till it gets cold. They're not going to do that, but they will use it as a, as a source of uh, cheap energy that they can put on and, and uh, uh, help them along their way. Um, suet for some of the other birds is good. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard to put something out that a that a black pole warbler is going to want to. I mean, it's hard to help some of these birds. It's like, oh uh, yeah, it's you know, I can't I can't help you, uh, Hudsonian godwit. You know, right? That um, I don't have food for you. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you do what you can. The other thing to do uh, to help birds along it during this is turn off your lights at night. That's a big one. Yeah. And of course, this really plays out in the cities. And then there are the the, the programs that uh, people have, uh, a number of organizations are working with, including the, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that are trying to encourage big cities to uh, cut down on their light usage uh, during peak migration time because birds get confused. If you think about moth, why do moths come to flames? Well, because when they're navigating in the old times, the what was light the sky was lighter than the ground and so if you wanted to go up all you had to do was follow the light and go up um and that doesn't work anymore that's now that that whole thing of you know follow the light follow the light because that light is up it's not and it gets birds confused it gets moths confused and sometimes especially in really bright light situations like like skyscrapers and things like that, it, it's uh, it can cause the death of the bird by causing that kind of confusion that they fly to the light and run into the windows and, and things like that. And so turn off your lights at night, uh, plant native plants, put up a hummingbird feeder. That doesn't do it all, but the, those are a couple of tangible things that people can do. Yeah, great starts. And we'll, we'll put... Um links to some of those things in the, the chat. There's a, to the lights out campaign and, and some other things that are, should be helpful resources. Great. Um, okay. This one's a little bit um, random, but we got a lot of questions about geese and specifically uh, Canada geese. So a lot of people are really confused about why some are sticking around and some migrate. So do you want to give us the quick rundown of that story? Sure. Um, yeah, it's confusing now. You know, 50 years ago, it wasn't that confusing. They were mostly just uh, migratory geese going going through most of, of North America. Um, but, and this is actually a really cool story because 100 years ago or so, uh, there was a, a, a form of subspecies of Canada goose called the giant Canada goose. And it lived in the around the Great Lakes area, and it was essentially resident. But they were uh, hunted out and were thought to be extinct a hundred years ago. And then somewhere in the '40s or '50s, somebody discovered a remnant population of them up in Wisconsin or Minnesota. I, I forget which. And it's like, oh my God, this thing isn't extinct. Here they are, and, and we need to save it. And and so, what do we do? What can we do? Well, let's take it and and you know, get all the eggs out of that one basket and and put some over here and put some over there. And and people said, oh yeah, you know, like Ohio was like, sure, we'll take some, and New York was like, yeah, we'll take some. And we'll see if they can uh, live somewhere else and what we can do. And lo and behold, it worked. They, they did reproduce and they kept reproducing and they kept reproducing and they kept pooping all, all over the, the golf courses. And it's like, oh, wait, uh, wait, the, we, don't, we don't need this many of them. And for a lot of parts of the country, they are the predominant form that you see are these giant Canada geese. Uh, and they are... They don't migrate. 
they move around a little bit as they have to if the water freezes and things like that but uh, they typically are resident and but still the the arctic breeding canada still pass through but they're just so not noticeable compared to the the residents that uh, that people have have transplanted all over the place so it does get a, a little bit confusing but we have like in new york there's a, a migratory uh hunting season or i mean they they actually regulate the hunting seasons differently for the 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 residents and the and the migrants to and we do recognize the fact that migrants are coming through uh and are probably um you know going further south than here to spend the winter but the other thing that's changed with uh with goose migration is um they back in again a fair number of years ago i think this was starting to happen maybe 50 years ago in the 60s or 70s that um the birds from Canada started what we call short stopping, and they were coming across, especially in central central U.S. and Canada, that uh, there were so many farm fields that the geese, instead of going down to Louisiana for the winter, they started stopping in uh, in Iowa. And it's like, meh, this is, there's a lot of food here. We don't need to go any further south. So they that actually changed some of the migratory pathways of the birds by providing them uh, some brand new uh, huge food source further north so they didn't they didn't end up going as far so birds apparently are very dynamic in the way they live their lives and they will change their their movement patterns and their distribution patterns based on the conditions at hand and we've seen this by watching it closely over the last 60 years or so we've seen a number of these stories that uh, the, the birds change where they live based on what's going on right um there are lots of other questions about uh, just exactly how they do it and um, but but i feel like this is a good segue into um we got a lot i would say like 70 percent of the questions we got are about um response to climate change and natural disasters um so this one's kind of relevant, especially uh, right now. Wendy asks, do hurricanes affect fall migration, especially thinking of Lee that just uh, went through the, went up the East Coast during peak migration? Yeah, I was thinking about Lee too, because it was come, I was on the coast of Massachusetts last week when it came through um, and it, they canceled my flight to get out. So um does it affect migration? Well, it affected me. I had to delay the day. Uh, and that's kind of the thing that that happens with, with birds is, yes, birds pay attention to the weather. Yes, they are sensitive to changes in the weather. Um, they do somehow seem to be able to um, recognize changes in uh, air pressure and barometric pressure. How they do that, I have, we have no idea. But, but there is evidence that they change their behavior based on, um, you know, what the, the air pressure is. And so they will be affected by this. They notice it, of course, but it depends on which way the winds are are, are going and you know what exactly that if they smack right into it, if it's coming straight up their their migratory route, um, that's a bad thing. <laughs> and they some birds can actually get what we call entrained into the, the the hurricane itself and carried far off course, like the flamingos that are currently all over uh Pennsylvania and in New Jersey and and Kentucky. stuff like that in Kentucky yes yeah, other than Kentucky too I, I left Ohio like the day before a couple showed up in southwestern Ohio I was visiting family but missed the the flamingos so those things are obvious kinds of displacements uh, of birds but yes the the other stuff happens too but the other thing to, to know is it's not a hurricane is not just a wind all in one direction it actually spins and so uh in the northern hemisphere they spin counterclockwise and so what that means is the so lee was coming up the east coast from the south going north north to northeast but on where i was in, in massachusetts on the the west side of that that hurricane uh the winds are from the north because that's moving moving north but it's spinning and we're getting those those winds that are coming off the top of the hurricane that were blowing from the north uh into uh, into new england and i was hoping that maybe that would wasn't going to bring any caribbean birds up with it 
Uh, those are on the east side of the, the hurricane. Uh, but the on the west side, I was hoping maybe something like some storm petrels or something might, you know, be pushed closer to land or maybe a gannet or, a, you know, a kittiwake or something like that from Nova Scotia would be blown down here. But I didn't find anything like that. All right. Um, so a lot of questions about fire that we experienced this summer, this past summer, especially. So Debbie asks, um, do we know how the forest fires in Canada and the Pacific Northwest and West have affected the timing and distance for migration this year? You know, what it's an interesting, it's, it's a, an obvious question to ask because the birds definitely had to have been affected by the by the fires. Um, and we, you know, I heard reports of some migrants coming through early that, you know, boreal breeding birds that uh, might have been affected, but I don't know any real hard evidence for that yet. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how the, the eBird reports shake out after the, the season's over and whether we can actually see, detect a, an early migration. Because if you're breeding habitat burns down it's like oops it's uh it's july might as well go back go south you know get started on the vacation there and, and beat the rush and, and get moving south yeah we will have to see yeah as uh, i say obviously the a huge event like that 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 you know covered the uh you know made the entire northeast be have yellow skies that uh has to have affected the birds in some way and now it's just not in a good way i'm pretty sure yeah. so except for the the blackback woodpeckers and three-toed woodpeckers okay. that are happy to to go in and and uh use the the burn stubs to this nesting and find the and the beetles that go in and love the dead trees and trees can't defend themselves anymore so the beetles can can take over and that is a food bonanza for these woodpeckers and and some other animals too to so they those burned areas are not not ruined um right. they're changed and birds will take advantage of the changes as best they can yeah all right a lot of questions about climate change here's one um pretty specific one are waterfowl flyways geographically shifting from their historic locations due to climate or other changes well i don't know of anything changing dramatically other than the, the short stopping example that I gave that happened with Canada geese and, and snow geese and, and some other birds. Um, and that again was uh, changes that historic changes that we made uh, with our farming practices. Um, and but I, I don't know about waterfowl specifically changing courses. They still seem to be traveling in most of the same same places that that they have certainly possibility, but I, I don't know of any evidence of that at the moment. What are some changes we've seen with, with bird migration in general with climate change? Well, there, there does seem to be to some advancement of, uh, of birds moving northward um, with some species. This is, isn't as widespread or as, as hard and fast as, as some people seem to think. But uh, there are there is evidence that some birds are showing up earlier because the temperatures are are getting uh, higher earlier, um, and that could be a good or a bad thing. As I said, birds change their distributions in their habits depending on the circumstances. They adapt, um, and it's this could be good for some birds that they get to have a longer breeding season because they get up there earlier, or it could be bad because it. it might not be met. We worry about the the fact that there, what was an indicator of you know food abundance coming may not be anymore. That the insects and the flowers may not have may not be advancing the same way that the migration would. And so if you if you get there get your timing wrong, then that could that could be a problem because again birds are are using cues. That aren't direct cues of the here's the food make your baby. Right. Um, it's a uh, you know if you start now kind of thing that by the time your your chicks are big enough that they need to be that they hatch and need to need to be fed, there will be insects around 
Um, so get started while there's still snow on the ground. You know, that's those things, if those get disconnected, that could be a problem. Um, and, and so we're, we're watching for that, but, um, you know, it's, it's, we haven't seen, you know, any, I don't think we've seen big successes and, and big failures yet from, right. from this mismatch or not of these changes there. If the changes, the birds will change. Um, but exactly how that's going to play out, we're watching, we're, we're looking at it to see people are, are interested in exactly these questions. <clears throat> right. I'm trying to figure out what to ask you with only five minutes left. <laughs> um, let's see. Someone asked, um, what distance is considered a migration? Because obviously bird, they're all different kinds of movements that birds make, but what is, what is a distance that qualifies as a migration? That's a fair question. And because birds move from everywhere from, uh, from, you know, a matter of miles to uh, a matter of thousands of miles. And some birds are like, say, American robins at the north end of their range uh, around some, we'll have robins. We always have robins on our Christmas count here in Ithaca and we're pretty far north. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the robins move as they have to. So the, the it, it looks like the snow cover is a good indicator of when robins move, that they like to forage on the ground and uh, they'll, a lot of robins only go when they need to. If the berries run out or if it, there gets to be too much snow cover and they can't find food, then they'll move further south. Some of them go, they just go and head to, to Georgia, you know, from Ontario or something like that. And you don't get them uh, sticking around, but, but some do. And I remember the, sometimes it's hard to know when, when I was at work doing my dissertation work in central Florida at Archibald Biological Station, we had, uh, the red-headed woodpeckers that were breeding in the scrub, they would fly south in the winter to the south end of the station and hang out in the, the longleaf pines during the, the winter. And it's like, what? It's, but it was, it was, it was an honest to God southward movement. Um, was it migration or was it just changing, you know, where their, their habitat, but, uh, Mm -hmm. It was that always struck me as like, yep, they fly south for the winter, and it's only they only fly ten miles, but hey, right. they're still going south. So I wouldn't call that migration, but uh, it's hard to say. And then there's some birds like crows and and blue jays where some birds stay put, and other ones go somewhere else. And for the crows, for our crows, um, I should say a lot of the crows north of us are mostly migratory. And almost everybody gets out of the the cold north in the winter and comes somewhere around here. And our birds, some of our birds that I've marked have followed them, have followed some of those birds down to Pennsylvania, uh, western Pennsylvania from here. I've gotten reports of tags being seen there. And we've gotten a few birds from Montreal and stuff like that. But most of my known birds, the breeders, they just stay put all winter. So this is a mixed migration strategy where some birds move and some birds don't. And for the crows, it appears that it's mostly non-breeders that are moving, but that, that's not necessarily uh, the case because sometimes birds just disappear for a while and then come back. So um, there are different, different strategies of migration, different birds all over the place. Very cool. All right, well, I think that's about it, Kevin. <laughs> Um, thanks to the audience for such great questions today. This was really fun. Thank you, Kevin, for taking the time to talk to us um, and sharing all of your fascinating stories about bird migration. Tomorrow, we will be emailing our Zoom attendees with the recorded webinar and some of the resources that we discussed today. If you're watching on YouTube, check the comments for those links and resources. Those will stick with the video. Um, and that's all for today. Uh, thanks again to Kevin and the audience. And yeah, thanks, you, thank you all for coming and, and participating. It's a, a lot of fun to, to talk birds. Yeah, enjoy. Thank you.